Well, good evening. Preparation for worship this evening is from Charles Spurgeon. I'm going to be thinking about hard work this evening, and Spurgeon said, Some people seem to think that hard work is not spiritual minded. Nonsense. Out with that difficulty if any of you are troubled by it. It's a good word from, from Spurgeon as we think about what we do throughout the, the week, working hard and the responsibilities that we've got. It's not as if somehow that, that's not pleasing to, to God. We're going to think about how it is and also what pitfalls to avoid this evening. Preparation for, uh, sorry, call to worship is from Psalm 132, verse 7. Let's go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Let's go to him in silent prayer asking that we would indeed be meeting the, the living God. Father, we do ask that you would be pleased by the, the worship that we bring, which is to say you'd be pleased by the, the state of our hearts, and that can only happen if you're working within our hearts to, to make ourselves pleasing to you. So we ask that you would, would do so and continue to, to do so that we might offer up our, ourselves, whether we're in the sanctuary, whether we're out in the, the field, whether we're in a, an office, whether we're at home, Father, whatever and wherever we find ourselves, that you might be delighting in what we do. And we ask this in your Son's name. Amen. We're going to be standing to praise our God together, singing verses 1 through 3 of All Glory Be to God on High. this God greets you with these words, grace, mercy, and peace be yours. And these come from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all of God's people said, and as God's welcomed us, let's welcome one another.
going to be reading together from Our World Belongs to God. So we've got testimony of faith rather than confession of, of faith, because confessions are, are binding. If you sign the, the covenant of office bearers, as elders and deacons do, you covenant to teach according to that. Testimony of faith is a little bit different. Um, we're going to read Article 13 of Our World Belongs to God. God directs and bends to his will all that happens in his world as history unfolds in ways we only know in part, all things from jobs to laws are under his control. God is present in our world by his word and spirit. The faithfulness of our great provider gives sense to our days and hope to our years. The future is secure for our world belongs to God going to be thinking about that with the work that we do and the wealth that we have. Uh, we're going to sing, uh, we'll sing this at Thanksgiving too, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. I think you're actually in big trouble as a pastor if you don't choose Now Thank We All Our God at Thanksgiving, but you, it's not yet November, so we can do it. Let's sing together three verses. Please be seated. I ask that the, the children please come forward for children and worship. You just beat her. You were that, that, that close. You almost had him. All right, we ready? Oh. Good job, honey. All right, may the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you, and may he be very, very gracious unto you. And may the Lord smile upon you, and may he give you his peace. Amen. You go in peace. Remember when I was little, my mom would put on her mommy voice on the phone, and I could always tell if it was a kid or if it was an adult, and I always totally... And then you become an adult, and you have like a voice with little kids that you use that suddenly becomes totally different, so... Yeah, such, such it is. I'm becoming my mother. Um, all right, usually become your father if you're a guy, but it's... All right, um, prayer requests, praises we can lift up before our God. Jonathan. That we can have a good Halloween, indeed. 
could be generous with your dad and give him all your candy. Is that something that... No? <laughs> yes, I got the elections this week. Man, it is fall. Halloween elections. Michael. Oh, nice. Grandson confirmed today. Congratulations. What's that little guy's name? What's that? What's his name? Ben. Jane. Indeed. Well, we did bring up Martin Luther a couple times, so there we go. We'll remember the Reformation as well. Let's go to our God in prayer. Father, we have much to, to give you thanks for. We think about the, the relative safety and the, well, far beyond relative safety that we enjoy. We think about other disciples of your son who live in incredibly hostile areas, Father, and we're able to, to dress up and go door to door and, and get candy. And Father, that requires a whole lot of safety and a whole lot of stability within a culture to simply have holidays like that. So we thank you for this. We think about how the psalms that are about the various festivals that would take place, looking forward to them, enjoying them, going on. And culture has its own holidays. And Father, we think not just about Halloween, of course. We think about Reformation. We think about what you did through your servant Martin Luther, as well through, through Calvin and through Zwingli. And Father... Think about the, the need of the church then to be reformed and the need of the church to continue to be reformed. We ask that we would be do so according to your, your word. Tradition and traditionalism, Father, is easy to, easy to fall into mere traditionalism in, in Luther's day. It's easy to fall into mere traditionalism in our day, and there's not life or vitality to be found there. There's life and vitality to be found in your Son. And so, Father, we ask that you'd work through us as a church to, to connect people with him and deepen the connection that we do have with him. And Father, as we think about the stability we have in uh, the culture, there's a lot of fear uh, about that. We think about the, the American experiment, and Father, how much, how much civic involvement and how much civic virtue it requires to, to continue on in a stable way. And so, Father, we pray for the elections coming up this week. Father, don't know which politician it was that, that spoke about all politics being local, but Father, that certainly is the case that a great deal of it is, and that's, that's good. And so Father, we thank you for the people who are, are willing to serve, those who have served faithfully, faithfully, and we ask that elections would have a good outcome for, for this community and the communities around this nation. And Father, we rejoice in, in the working of your, your spirit. We think about Knobloch's grandson, Ben, being confirmed today. And Father, we think about all that he had to, to learn. We ask that you'd fix it not just in his mind, Father, but Father, it'd be fixed in his action. He'd continue to be not just a hearer of the word, but more and more a doer. And we thank you for the step that he took today and in that direction, Father. And that's a great reason for joy. We ask that Ben would continue to grow and to mature, that he would be recognizing those who have come before him. He would be emulating their faith, as the book of Hebrews speaks about. And Father, we pray for, for different relationships that you'd bring into to Ben's life, that he might grow more and more to be a man of, a man of you. Father, we pray that for the, the children and the young people of our own congregation as well. They might grow more and more to, to be people of, of your word, following your ways, 
holding out your, your word in the, the midst of a crooked and depraved generation, as, as Paul talks about. And that's not to say we're any better than, than anybody else, Father, but rather to recognize that we know how incredibly harmful and deforming everything in this world is, unless, Father, we, we take it in, in thanksgiving to you and in your ways. And as we think about hard work and wealth this evening, we know these are our great gifts. But, Father, these also can totally control our lives, and we don't want that either. So we ask that we would take the, the gifts and love the giver and be grateful. And, Father, we, we ask all of this in the name of your Son. Amen. As we prepare to hear God's Word, we're going to sing a song we often sing about when it comes to wealth. Three verses of We Give You But Your Own. You can either open your Bible to Proverbs 30, or you can use your handy Halloween Reformation Day colored sheet. All right, we got orange and black sheets today, and the proverb that we'll be reading will be on the back of the sheet. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have known you and say, Lord, or I may become poor and steal, and so dishonor the name of my God. You're going to see that's actually the last verse we're going to study. Hence, it's the last verse on the sheet. So, yeah, just have the sheet before you. You'll, have, you'll know exactly where we are in the sermon. Let's go to our God in prayer. Father, we do ask that you would make us wise. We ask that we might be wiser as a result of studying this portion of your word, and that we might not just be hearers of this wisdom, but doers of it, and that's, that's so hard. It's easy for us to, to watch, how to do, watch somebody else do something technical, but when it's our turn to do it, it's a little intimidating. Father, it's easy to, to hear what you have to say about hard work and wealth, but when it's ours to do, to carry out, it can be a bit intimidating. So we ask that you might give us wisdom on how to do it well and give us generosity of spirit towards others as they're seeking to do it well and patience with our, ourselves as well. How often you're far more long-suffering with ourselves in certain areas than, than we are even as you're quicker to correct sin in ourselves than we are. Help us to become more like you. And we ask this in the name of your Son. Amen. Please be seated. Now, I don't want to throw, I'm really actually I'm not nervous, but you talk about hard work to hardworking people, and sometimes it can be like throwing gas on fire. It, because hard work is a really, really good thing, but hard work can also be bad. Um, how many of us haven't found, okay, let's say that you've got difficulties in other areas of, of your life, say, say at home, work can be a safe place where you don't have to deal with those difficulties. So sometimes hard work for some of us can become uh, a way of avoiding the actual hard work we need to do. So again, we're going to extol hard work and say hard work is a wonderful thing. It's a, it's a good servant, but it's a, it's a horrible master. And the same is true with wealth. Wealth is a really good thing, but it's a really horrible master. 
Scripture has a very nuanced view of, of wealth. It doesn't celebrate rich people. It doesn't condemn rich people. It says wealth is really important, and it says wealth doesn't really matter in the end. And the Bible's got a really nuanced view of wealth because that's what's needed because wealth is a really complicated matter. We, we, we think about wealth differently. Some of us think about wealth in terms of freedom. If I've got more than enough, I can do whatever I want. That, that, that's freedom. I'm not constrained by any sort of limitations because I've got enough to do it. If only I had a bit more, I could do a bit more. I'd be more free. Some of us think about wealth in terms of, of security. If I've got enough, I'm never going to need to ask anybody else for help. And no matter what happens, I'm going to be okay. Some of us think about wealth that way. Some of us think about wealth in terms of, of power. Here's what I can make happen because I've got enough resources. And some of that's good. Some of that can be a bit, a bit bad. But we think about wealth differently, and wealth is really complicated. And so honoring hard work and thinking about wealth, these are, are both things to, to extol wealth and hard work, but they can also be horrible pitfalls in people's lives, which is to say they're not purely good. If you take a look at the back of your sheet, we've we got six questions here, and they're split into three, I don't know, I was going to say biads, but that's not what it is, couplets, there we go. So the first two questions we'll talk about now, we'll talk about the next two questions in our first point and the final two questions in our last point. But thinking about wealth and thinking about hard work, and we've all got a complicated relationship with each of them, I want you to first write down two words that describe your relationship with hard work. It, it could be identity. Maybe you find your identity in saying, you know, I'm a hard worker, and that that's something that's really to be appreciated, and there's something good about that. Maybe for you it's, it's temptation. A sense of, I think it's really good, good to work hard, but I can't seem to stop. And the same with, with wealth. Write down whatever two words come to your mind when you think about your relationship with these. Working hard and wealth are good, but they're not purely good. That's what we're going to, to be seeing, and I'm sure that's what you see as you think about your own life. These are good. Working hard is really good, but it's not purely good. And wealth is really good, but it's not purely good. That's the claim of this sermon. We're going to study this in two points. First, working hard. Second, wealth. First is, is working hard. Solomon wrote and collected all these different Proverbs because he wanted to train the young people in Israel to live productive lives. He's, he's doing it, in some ways pitching it for his own sons of trying to raise his, his own boys, but it's to be used with young people throughout the, the land and has been used to, to help young people live productive lives. And working hard it's necessarily part. You can't live a productive, meaningful life without being willing to, to work hard for what you want. Proverbs 10, verse 5, He who gathers crops in summer 
is a prudent son, but he who sleeps during harvest is a disgraceful son. What Solomon's saying is work needs to be done when it needs to be done. Right, that there's no farmer here who's thinking, you know what, let's just push off the harvest until Christmas vacation. Right? No, you, you do it when it needs to be done. Working hard involves submitting yourself to the realities on the ground. So maybe it's going to be raining the next day, so you, you push it really hard late into the night before because you want to get that work done. And hard work requires planning. It's Proverbs 12, 27, The lazy do not roast any game, but the diligent feed on the riches of the hunt. This is saying is diligent people, people who are, are planning ahead and want to work hard, they're willing to, to inconvenience themselves to get ahead. Or they know that they want to stay up late to catch the game that they want to get. Or good fishermen know that there's certain fish you need to get up really early if you want to catch. And they're willing to do that. Now, good contractors, they, they lay out everything for the day before so they're, they're, they have a sense of what they're going to be doing and they can hit the ground running the next morning. Or good managers of, of retail stores, they, they know what they want the, the layout to be for the store for, for the next season. They've already got it in mind this season so that they can, they can make the changes and hit the next season running. So planning ahead is part of, of working hard. And then doing your plans, I mean, it's one thing to plan ahead. Doing your plans is the hard part. That, that's what needs to be done, and that's Proverbs 14, 23. All hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. And this isn't saying that talking for a living is, is somehow less than another job. The scripture is clear that politicians and plumbers, they, they both got their, 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 their role to play. And you don't want to be setting blue-collar and white-collar jobs uh, against each other. Even those labels don't do any good. It, it's not as if somehow somebody's less than somebody else because, well, they work with their hands. But it's also not as if somebody who works with their hands is necessarily better than somebody who doesn't. This proverb isn't about any of that. The proverb is about saying, don't just make plans, do your plans. All hard work brings profit, but mere talk. So just, just planning and saying, well, yeah, we're going to do this, that leads only to poverty. So it's essentially just walking your talk at work. And planning and executing your plans are necessary. Proverbs 12, 11, those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense. Right, what this is saying is the easiest thing for all of us to do is to imagine what it would be like in another situation and then do that. Right, it's, it's super easy to imagine what it would be like to be a movie star and figure out what sort of movies you would like to be in. The hard work is actually becoming the movie star. It's easy for us to imagine if only I, was in, if only I had that job or if only I, I had this person's position. Here's what I do. The hard part is actually to say, well, this is actually the situation you're in. What are you going to do in the situation you're in? Because the situation you're in is where you see the obstacles, where you see the difficulties, where you see the limitations, and what are you going to do about them? One of our favorite things to do as humans is to, to daydream about what we would do if we didn't have these problems. And Solomon here is saying, okay, well, that, that doesn't produce anything, though, so bloom where you're planted. It's getting down to work that brings results. Proverbs 12, 24 says that diligent hands will rule, but laziness ends in forced labor. This is saying those who work hard generally get ahead. Imagine two ladies. They're both starting there. They both get the same job like at a company that they've got multiple hires for the same job. One of them works hard. The other one is, is honestly pretty lazy you would be really worried about that company if they had the same career trajectory and got promoted at the same level, right? I mean, any workplace that, that doesn't reward hard work and is, is fine with, with laziness, that, that's a workplace that's headed for a whole lot of trouble. And hard workers need that reminder. They need to hear what's in Proverbs 22, 29. Do you see someone skilled in their work? They'll serve before kings. They will not serve before officials of low rank. What it's saying is hard work winds up being appreciated. And again, Proverbs, it's, it's generally true. You can think about exceptions, but those are the exceptions that prove the rule. Generally, hard work is appreciated. And Solomon's saying it, it's notable 
because those who work incredibly hard and want to do the best job they can are rarer than they, they like to think. The one who refuses to work is, in the words of, of Proverbs, called a sluggard. Proverbs 6.6 6 is the most famous one with this. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. This is, this is lighthearted joking what is what this is. It's saying, okay, to the sluggard, the ant doesn't even think. It can't even think. But instinctually, it knows to do what you need to do. You need to work while there's opportunity to work. You need to make hay while the sun shines. Otherwise, you're going to wind up worse than an ant. And the sluggard needs to actually wind up suffering consequences for laziness, or he, he often won't change. That's what's going on with Proverbs 16, 26. A worker's appetite works for him. His mouth urges him on. And what this is to say is a society that winds up subsidizing sluggardness and, and, and laziness, it's on a trajectory for destruction. This is what Bruce Waltke says on this. It says, Though work is tiring and frustrating in this fallen world, nevertheless, the drive to gratify his appetites prods the diligent person to produce efforts. The history of civilization is unimaginable without it. So yeah, work is difficult. It's got frustrations. There's often times when we wish we didn't have to do it at all. But if we didn't have to do it at all, most likely we wouldn't produce really anything that would be of benefit to other people. Now, laziness should bring consequences, just like hard work should bring consequences. Proverbs 13, 4, a sluggard's appetite's never filled, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. What Solomon's saying here, that's, it's no different now than it was then. People who aren't willing to work for what they want still want what they want, and they still usually think they got coming to them what they want. It's the, the sluggard wants the rewards of hard work, but isn't willing to work for it. And the diligent person is willing to work for it. That, that's the difference. So the diligent person should be the one that receives it. And the diligent people tend to get ahead, and the lazy people tend to fall behind. Proverbs 10.4, lazy hands make poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. Well, what, what this is saying is there's no neutral gear in this regard. There's always p potential for, for trouble. So either you're going to be getting ahead, saving, working towards your goals, or you're setting yourself up for a fall. Bruce Waltke again, chaos ever threatens to undo the created order, and if unchecked by diligence, destroys hard-earned wealth. All right, this is why often companies that do incredibly well, what they do is they tend to rest on their laurels, and then what happens to them? They usually go bankrupt within about five, ten years. They innovated well, that they got ahead, and then they just rested on their laurels. Where companies that continue to innovate, continue to seek to try to get ahead, continue to get ahead. You stay hungry, you stay alive. So hard work matters. Now the most celebrated person in Proverbs, and all of Proverbs is, is a hard worker. That's the Proverbs 31 woman. She gets up while it's still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her task. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. Now, this isn't a prescription. Sometimes women view this as a prescription and they wind up absolutely hating the Proverbs 31 because there's a sense of, well, I'm not going to live up to, to that. Well, it's not exactly the call to live up to this. It's not saying, well, unless you get up before the sun gets up and unless, you go to, unless you're up quite a bit after the, the sun sets that you're not going to, to somehow make it or be a good woman. That's not what this is about. It's just saying this, this is a picture of, a, of an ideal. So it's a, per, a picture, not a prescription. It's just saying that hard work is to be celebrated. So you see somebody working hard, you, you should celebrate that. Now take a look at the second list of questions on your sheet. What advantages has hard work brought you? 
and what consequences has failing to work hard brought you? And you can think about work hard in terms of not just working hard in the workplace, it could also be working hard at, at school, it could be working hard in terms of a skill that you're trying to, to acquire. So what advantages has it working hard brought you and what consequences has failing to work hard in some area brought you? God is a hard worker. First two chapters of Genesis, they, they've got a whole lot going on in there, but a large part of it is saying, look at God. He's, he's a worker. Look what he does. Look at every day. Look at, his, look at this work week of his. He is busy, and he gets it all done before he rests. And Jesus, he thinks about creation, and then he talks about how he's busy too, and he's a hard worker. This is what he says, thinking about creating the world. He thinks about himself now. He says, my father's always at his work to this very day, and I'm working too. Now, work's not bad. Hard work isn't bad. It's a way of imitating God, and it brings great benefits provided you, you keep it in its place. And the same goes for wealth, and that's our second point, wealth. Proverbs is a book about wisdom. That's the, the, main, that's the main focus, is becoming wise, gain wisdom. Whatever you do, gain wisdom. Whatever you have to give up, get wisdom. And wisdom brings wealth. Proverbs 8, 17 to 18. This is wisdom speaking. I love those who love me, so I do good to those who do good to me. You pay attention to me, I'm going to take care of you, is what wisdom says. And those who seek me, find me. With me are riches and honor, enduring wealth and prosperity. The idea here is that wise management of a company is going to tend to, to increased profits. Poor management of a company is going to tend to, to, to less earnings. That, that's generally the way it's going to go. You might be able to think about exceptions, but every one of those exceptions is the, the exception that proves the rule. Wisdom brings wealth, and wealth has a whole lot of benefits. Proverbs 14, 24, the wealth of the wise is their crown. The folly of fools yields folly. Um, if you've got sufficient funds, the chances of you getting evicted from your apartment or your home are a good deal less, and being evicted is horribly painful. Um, if you've got enough money, you can afford different opportunities for your, for your kids. These are, are good things that, that wealth brings. Yes, most people, would you rather have a, a lot of money or, or not enough money? Very few people are going to say, I'd really like to have not enough money. Most people are going to want the money because of opportunities that it brings. This is, is Tevia from the Fiddler on the Roof speaking to, to God. Oh, Lord, you made many, many poor people. And I realize, of course, it's no shame to be poor, but it's no great honor either. Wealth can buffer you from a lot of sorrows. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city, but poverty is the ruin of the poor. But it's a double-edged sword because all these various ways that wealth benefits you, you learn to depend on these as time goes on. You learn to trust in wealth because of all it can do for you. 
That's what Jesus is after when he says, how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Money can do so much for you that you come to depend on it and you start to think that what takes care of you is your savings account and that your security for the future is not the God who gives you your daily bread, but the fact that you've got enough money saved up for daily bread. That's the, that's the danger of riches. So it's not like money or wealth in itself is bad, but it can do so much for us that we start to put our trust in it. And we become far more afraid of, of losing wealth than we do of dishonoring God. In these words of Jesus, how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, let's think about ourselves. Because you and I, we live in a culture that the wealth would have been unimaginable to Solomon. Solomon, wealthiest person around in his day. What you have would have been unimaginable to him. Not even Solomon in all his splendor took a shower that was warm like you do. Not even Solomon in all his splendor had food stored up like you do. Not even Solomon in all his splendor had various goods stored up like you do. I'm not speaking about you in terms of relation to, relative to other people in the culture, but, can, but in comparison to Solomon, you got way more. Just unimaginable what we have compared to him. And also, at the turn of the 20th century, what, what we have is totally unimaginable. Our standard of living would just be incomprehensible to people living in 1901. Just totally incomprehensible. So we need to take Jesus' word seriously because in some ways we are the, the, the rich man that Jesus is warning about. How hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. But also in other ways we're not because I would imagine that most of us probably fall within the, the general de definition of middle class depending on how you define it. Very few of us would have enough money that we would actually be able to, to really throw financial weight enough around to, to really manipulate people to do what we want. Very few of us would be so financially secure in what we have that no matter what would happen in the United States in the next five years, we would know that we would be totally okay and we wouldn't even break a sweat. Very few of us would find ourselves in that situation. And it's not bad if you find yourself in that situation, but you're just in a different financial category. So thinking about your, your final set of questions, in what ways do you consider yourself wealthy? And again, thinking terms here in, in terms of finances, um, wealthy in terms of friends and family, these are our good things, but that's not what we're thinking about tonight. And next, are there any ways in which you're, you're different from the rich in, in our day?
My guess is possibly the answers to the final question, the word can't might have been at the, the beginning of some of them. Can't do this or can't do that. Uh, wealth can do a whole lot for us. But in the end, it actually can't do anything. That's not to say it can't do quite a bit when you're alive, but when you die, it can't do anything. That's what's going on with Proverbs 11.4. Wealth is worthless in the day of wrath but righteousness delivers from death. So saying, God is not going to care what income tax bracket you found yourself in. He's not gonna say, well, you obviously did pretty well for yourself. I'm dealing with a pretty stellar candidate here. I, I better take that into account. He's not gonna, you're not, God's not gonna be impressed one way or the other. He's also not gonna hold it against somebody who's got a lot of money. He's interested in their righteousness. He's not interested in whether you were an employer or an employee. He's interested, well, what did you do with what you had? He's not interested in saying, okay, did you do better than your parents did or did you not do better than your parents did? He's interested in the heart. And this means we would be very wise to use whatever we've got in ways that are honoring to God. That's Proverbs 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Well, the first fruits, the idea of first fruits is, okay, you give God what's first as a sign of trust. You don't assess what you can give and then say, this is how much I could give without a standard of living change for me. This is how much I can give without any belt tightening at all. It's just to say, God gave me this first, so I give it to God as a sign that he takes care of me. God's into cultivating trust because he cares about righteousness. And God believes Proverbs 28, verse 6, better the poor whose walk is blameless than the rich whose ways are perverse. And well, I need to ask myself, do I believe that? Do I actually believe that a single mom who struggles with bills every month but loves God, gives herself totally over to God, is trying to raise her kids in God's ways. Do I actually think she's more blessed than somebody who can take vacations whenever they want, wherever they want? Do I, do I really think that? that? That's the question for me. That's the question for you. What do we think really is blessed? I mean, do I really think that the man who isn't sure he's going to be able to retire due to his financial situation but follows Jesus, do I really think he's more blessed than the man who could retire right now if he wants to, but doesn't care anything about Jesus, but just doesn't need to, doesn't need to work anymore. Do, do I really think that the, the one who trusts God is better off than the one who doesn't, despite where they're at financially? I mean, yeah, it'd be a four, whole lot better to be able to be able to take vacations whenever you, wherever you want to and follow God. That, that's, that's the best of all worlds in regards to these two. But what Jesus says would be applicable to that person just like it's applicable to all of us. He says, you can't serve two masters. Either you're going to hate one and love the other or you're going to be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. And what he's saying is eventually money's going to call you to do something. Money's going to call you to a decision that's totally opposed to what God's going to call you to. And who are you going to go to when push comes to shove? It's like when you're trying to keep two different groups of people happy. Like you're trying to keep, say, your employer happy and, and your spouse happy. Eventually they're going to come into conflict and you're going to have to tick somebody off. That's what Jesus is saying. You're going to have to either go with God or you're going to go with money eventually. Which one are you going to go when push comes to shove? doesn't mean you can't have money, but money is, a, man, money is so tricky in that it, it, does it, it says it's your servant, but it very quickly wants to become your master. Now Jesus, he strikes this balance best. He strikes it better than anybody sees that wealth isn't bad, it's very good, but it's not everything. Proverbs 38, 38 to 9 explains this nuanced view. It says, Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I might have too much and disown you and say, Who's the Lord? Or I might become rich and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. Now, when I was, when I was younger and read this, I mean, I grew up in the, and I'm still in the, the middle class. I'm like, hey, that's really great because I'm in the middle class. I find myself in the most righteous group of people. So I'm not wealthy, so I'm just going to say, well, God, I don't need you because I got money. And I'm not poor to the point where I'm just going to totally steal because I think I need to get ahead. But that, that's not what it's about. What it's about is saying, it's showing you wealth is really good. 
I mean, it's good for you if you don't have to worry about what you're going to eat tomorrow. That's a really good situation to be in. But it's also saying it's dangerous because you might forget where your daily bread really comes from. So you've got to ask yourself, I've got to ask myself, which of those two is my usual temptation? Am I more prone to be really fearful about what financially is going to happen tomorrow? Or am I more prone to forget who takes care of me? And you can probably look back in different situations and say certain seasons, I was really afraid of where money was going to come from. This was a situation on the farm. This is a situation with the job. These were the bills that were piling up. And you know what it's like to be in that category. And there's other times where it's like, Something happens and, and, and you are financially worse off than, than you were before and you realize, man, I was totally taking all this for granted. I thought I was doing all this. Now Jesus, he, he's the one that strikes this balance best because he owns everything. Nobody's richer than Jesus. He's God. He can do whatever he wants with whatever he wants. Everything that you have is yours. Not like in a, like a cutesy way, but he could just take it and there's nothing you could do about it because it, it's his. He made it. He sustains it. It's his. He just gives it to you as a trust. He's God. But also, he self-selects poverty as his lifestyle. That's what Paul says. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. So the same God who arranges life so that generally hard work leads to getting ahead, he also chose when he says, okay, well, how do I want to live as a human? I'm going to be dirt poor. There's nothing wrong with that either. I mean, this should, the, the way of life we live should give us pause when we're unwilling to work hard, and yet we want what other people have. But also the incarnation of the Son of God should give us pause when we think that we're better than anybody else who has less than us, or we think it's our decisions and our own wisdom that, that, that has totally made us successes. Because why would we ever think, well, well I'm better than Jesus? Because he's got less. There's no dishonor in either. All of this is to say, hard work and wealth are good, but there's far more important matters in life. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we think about your word in Deuteronomy with, through Moses with you speaking to the people about giving them the ability to, to produce wealth and that's a good thing. And Father, we also think about your, your son and, and his life that there's certainly nothing wrong with, with having less. The son of man had, didn't even have a place to, to lay his head. And Father, in both of these, the, the way forward is trust. We don't want to have so much, Father, that we, that we deny you and think that we take care of ourselves, that we live by our, our bank account alone and not every promise that comes from your mouth. And Father, we also don't want to have so little and a scarcity mentality as if, Father, we really think we're living our own hand to mouth rather than your hand to our mouth, which is why we do we pray. We say, give us this day our daily bread. Father, we ask that we might go forward with this, this attitude in this week. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This next one, I think this, this, the, the tune is pretty familiar. What did you say, Jane? All right, we'll give this one a shot. I don't know if we've sang this while I've been here. But let's stand to sing God Who's Giving Knows No Ending.
Uh, and whoever tells me which other song has that tune, two, two pieces of candy. It's, it's generosity of spirit today. Let's go to God in our prayer and prayer for the for CCEF for this offering. Father, we lift before you your throne of grace, the, the work of CCEF. Father, we think about people it helps with Christian education. And Father, we ask that you give wisdom to deacons as they administer this. And Father, all various other, other funds in the, the church. And Father, we ask that we might go forth this week as we thought about with working hard for, for you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. After God's parting blessing, we'll sing the first verse of God of mercy, God of grace. Now to him who's able to do far more than all we ask or imagine, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory and majesty in the church in Christ Jesus throughout all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs> 